Karen McMillan had always felt safe behind the walls of her pristine suburban home. From her window, she could watch the world unfold exactly as she liked it, predictable, controlled, and familiar. But the day Derek Foster moved in, everything changed. His skin, darker than anyone else's on Maplewood Lane, sent a jolt of fear through her that she couldn't quite explain. She told herself it was just a feeling, a gut instinct to protect her neighborhood. But deep down, Karen knew it was more than that. It was the kind of fear that had lived in her heart for years, unchallenged, unspoken. And now, it had found a target. When she picked up the phone to call the police, her fingers trembled with righteousness. But behind that righteous facade was the terror of confronting a truth about herself she wasn't ready to face. What she didn't know was that this call, the one meant to protect her illusion of control, would unravel everything she thought she knew about her world and herself. Because Derek wasn't just another man she could dismiss with a label. He was the one man who would expose her darkest fear to the light, that the real danger had never been him, but her own blind prejudice. Karen McMillan was always on the lookout. Her perch by the front window was her favorite spot, the perfect place to keep an eye on the comings and goings in the quiet cul-de-sac of Maplewood Lane. Every morning, coffee in hand, she would stand by the glass, peering through her floral curtains like a self-appointed watchdog of the neighborhood. Today, though, something new caught her attention. A moving truck pulling up in front of the house next door. The old owners had moved out weeks ago and she'd been wondering who would replace them. The anticipation had kept her glued to the window more often than usual. Now, as she saw a tall black man step out of the truck, Karen's stomach clenched. Oh, great, she muttered to herself. What is this world coming to? It wasn't long before the man's wife and two children stepped out of the car that followed. They seemed polite enough, Karen noted, but she couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. She watched as the couple supervised the movers, their kids running excitedly in and out of the house. For the next few days, Karen made it a point to observe Derek and his family. She saw him leave for work every morning, dressed sharply in a suit, and return late in the evening. His wife, Naomi, often waved to the neighbors, but Karen avoided eye contact. She didn't trust them, not in the least. Days turned into weeks, and Derek's family settled in. The kids played in the front yard, their laughter echoing down the street, while Naomi frequently went for morning jogs. Derek himself was always calm, collected, and friendly. But for Karen, it was unsettling. Karen began making small talk with her other neighbors, casually mentioning Derek whenever she could. I don't mean to sound paranoid, she'd start, leaning in conspiratorially. But have you noticed anything strange about our new neighbors? The other neighbors would brush her off. Derek and his family were polite, hardworking, and kept to themselves. Nothing unusual. That didn't sit well with Karen. On a particularly sunny Saturday, Karen spotted Derek in his driveway, talking on his phone. He was pacing back and forth, his voice low but firm. She couldn't make out the words, but she was certain that whatever he was discussing was serious. To her, it looked suspicious. Why was he pacing like that? And why was his voice so hushed? He was probably involved in something illegal, she thought. Maybe drugs. Or worse. That evening, she decided to report her concerns to the neighborhood watch. They were having a small gathering at Mr. Olson's house at the end of the street. When Karen arrived, she wasted no time. Has anyone else noticed our new neighbor, Derek? She began, her voice loud enough for everyone to hear. I don't want to jump to conclusions, but I've seen him on the phone outside, acting all secretive. I think he's up to something. The group exchanged uneasy glances, but most of them shrugged it off. Karen, he's probably just talking to his colleagues, said one neighbor. He's been nothing but nice since he moved in. But Karen wasn't convinced. I'm telling you, something's not right, she insisted. Mark my words, we're going to regret ignoring this. Over the next few days, her paranoia grew. She started filming Derek on her phone whenever she saw him outside. The footage showed nothing more than a man going about his daily life, but to Karen, every moment was suspect. Karen reached her breaking point one afternoon when she saw Derek outside again, this time with a group of friends. 
They were laughing, talking animatedly and enjoying a barbecue in his backyard. To Karen, the sight of a gathering of black men was alarming. What are they plotting? She muttered, watching from behind her curtains. Without hesitation, Karen grabbed her phone and dialed 911. Yes, I'd like to report a suspicious man in my neighborhood, she said in a shaky voice. He's having a gathering and it seems really out of place. They're all, well, they don't look like they belong here. The dispatcher asked for details, but Karen embellished the story. He's been pacing around making strange phone calls and I think he might have a weapon. I'm worried for our safety. After hanging up, Karen felt a surge of adrenaline. She had done the right thing. Surely the police would investigate and her suspicions would be confirmed. It didn't take long for the police to arrive. Two squad cars pulled up to Derek's house and Karen eagerly watched from her window as the officers got out. They approached Derek's yard, where the barbecue was still in full swing. Derek and his friends stopped laughing as they noticed the officers approaching. Can I help you officers? Derek asked, stepping forward calmly. We received a report about suspicious activity in the area, one of the officers explained. Do you mind if we ask you a few questions? Karen watched with bated breath, hoping to see the officers uncover something incriminating. But instead of panicking, Derek simply nodded. Of course, he said. But first, let me get something from inside. He disappeared into the house for a moment, and Karen's heart raced. Was this it? Was he grabbing a weapon? When Derek returned, he wasn't holding a weapon. He was holding a badge. I'm Chief Derek Foster, FBI, he said, handing the badge to the officers. I oversee national security operations in this district. The officer's demeanor changed immediately. They stood up straighter, their tone respectful. We're sorry for the disturbance, sir, one of them said, handing back the badge. We didn't realize. It's all right, Derek replied calmly, but I'd like to know who made this report. The officers glanced at each other uncomfortably. A neighbor, one of them mumbled. We can't disclose their identity. But Derek already knew. He glanced over at Karen's house, his eyes narrowing. She ducked behind her curtains, heart pounding, knowing full well he had seen her. The next morning, the entire neighborhood knew what had happened. Karen's false report had backfired in the worst possible way. Word spread quickly that Derek was not only an innocent man, but the chief of the FBI in the area. People whispered about Karen's overreaction, and her reputation plummeted. At first, Karen tried to act like nothing had happened. She avoided her neighbor's stares, but the guilt weighed heavily on her. She couldn't even bring herself to go to the neighborhood watch meetings anymore. The story of racist Karen calling the cops on her black FBI neighbor had become the talk of the town. Meanwhile, Derek and his family continued to live peacefully. If the incident had bothered him, he didn't show it. He remained polite, waving to neighbors as he left for work, playing with his kids in the yard and hosting friends without fear. Karen, on the other hand, found herself isolated Neighbors who once greeted her warmly now avoided her. The friendly chats she'd had with others while out gardening were gone. Even the police had warned her about filing false reports, hinting that she might face consequences if she continued her paranoid behavior. As the weeks went by, Karen began to feel the weight of her actions. She had become the villain in her own story, the embodiment of every Karen stereotype the media loved to portray. She couldn't even walk down the street without feeling the cold stares of her neighbors. Derek's family, on the other hand, flourished. His wife Naomi had joined the local PTA and their kids were making friends at school. Despite the rocky start, they had been embraced by the community, everyone except Karen. One afternoon, Karen received a knock on her door. It was Derek. She hesitated before opening, but she knew she couldn't avoid him forever. Hello, Karen, he said, his voice calm but firm. I just wanted to clear the air between us. Karen swallowed hard, unsure of what to say. I know you called the police on me, Derek continued, and I'm not here to make a scene, but I want you to understand how serious that was. People like me face these situations every day, and it could have ended much worse. Karen looked down, her cheeks burning with shame. I, I'm sorry, she stammered. I just didn't, I didn't realize. That's the problem, 
Derek said. You didn't take the time to realize. But I hope you've learned something from this. With that, he turned and walked away, leaving Karen standing in her doorway overwhelmed with guilt. From that day on, Karen made an effort to change. She started attending community meetings that addressed racial bias, and she began to question her own prejudices. It wasn't an easy journey, but it was a necessary one. As for Derek, he continued to serve his community with pride, knowing that his calm demeanor had turned a potential disaster into a moment of growth for Karen, and hopefully for the entire neighborhood.